Hello everybody, both live audience and online audience. Uh, welcome to our second seminar of this semester series. And today I have the pleasure to introduce Silvia Segetzi from Birkbeck University of London. Silvia graduated in 2014 in psychology at the University of Milano Bicocca, where she also obtained her master's in clinical neuropsychology two years later. In 2017, she started her PhD in the Paulesu lab in Milan, which, during which she also spent a year as a visiting student at the Phil in London, UCL. In 2020, she uh, joined as a, a postdoc fellow at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience from the University College London, uh, where she also worked with Patrick Haggard, among others. And just recently, she got awarded with a lecturer position at Birkbeck University, which is where you can find her today. <laughs> and Celia is the author of several publications in the field of intentional actions, sense of agency, and more in general, model cognition. And her main investigation methods are neuroimaging as well as brain stimulation and mathematics techniques. So, Celia, the mic is yours. We are very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluigi. Thank you, everybody, for finding the time to come here and listen to my talk today. So I've been thinking about what to present here today, and I kind of decided that I will offer you a sort of broad overview of my research topic with some glimpses from different experiments rather than going too much in details on a single experiment. So then if you're interested in something specific, just feel free to come and talk to me. So my broad research area is of voluntary actions, and voluntary actions are crucial feature of human mind, but still uh, it seems like uh, um, experimental psychology didn't really put too much attention to uh, voluntary actions. It seems like there is a sort of a negative space in the literature all around voluntary actions. And one of the main reasons is clearly because studying voluntary action is particularly challenging. It's challenging because you almost have the feeling when uh, you put voluntary actions into the lab setting, the voluntary part seems to disappear completely. So it's a challenge, but it's a very important one, and my research is trying to take some very, very tiny modest steps towards uh, exploring the new cognitive processes underlying voluntary actions. And the first problem that researchers interested in voluntary action encounter when they start their investigation is uh, cognitive neuroscience doesn't provide any satisfactory account of what a voluntary action is. And my approach personally is to try to identify some sort of features that can make some action more voluntary than others. And the features that I believe are important are intention driven, deliberation, goal directedness, and some sort of subjective experience. Probably these features are not uh, uh, sufficient on its own to make an action voluntary, but somehow it feels like they must be necessary. And so what I'm trying to do today is just to show you some work that I've done in each of these uh, features, voluntary action, and let's see whether I will convince you or not. So the most common uh, traditional approach to voluntary action has defined them by contrasting them with stimulus-driven action. So imagine that you have a continuous continuum. On the one hand, you have actions that are immediately triggered by a stimulation. So the form of the action, the timing of the action, the occurrence of the action is directly determined by some immediate stimulation. And the reflexes, for example, are the most uh, common example. At the opposite side of the continuum, we have intention driven action. We also call them internally generated actions. And the idea is that these actions are not directly determined by any identifiable stimulation. Of course, it's not that simplistic because probably our voluntary actions are still somehow located on this continuum. So it's very hard to isolate actions that are completely intention driven or completely stimulus driven. But my personal attempt is to try to move towards this side of the spectrum. And um, although a bit simplistic, this operationalization has turned out to be very useful in identifying some sort of uh, neural markers of voluntary actions, there are green regions, green processes that have been associated constantly, even not exclusively, with voluntary action. One of the most uh, widely recognized is uh, the activity of the mesial wall of the prefrontal cortex. So if we go back to 1987, Passingham showed in animal studies that uh, if you have a lesion of the pre-supplementary motor area, we selectively compromise the ability of the animal to make spontaneous movements. 
if we um, generate a lesion in the lateral, not mesial, side of the neurotic cortex, uh, animals are still able to make voluntary actions, voluntary in the sense that uh, spontaneous, not triggered by a stimulus, but they lose the, the ability to uh, respond conditionally to a stimulus. And um, the role of the quasi elementary motor area, but mesia frontal cortex, more in general, has been confirmed in uh, um, human studies. So here you can see an example in which we compared a condition in which we explicitly told participants make this action versus a condition in which participants were free and to decide themselves which action to make. And again, you can see activity of the mesial wall of the prefrontal cortex. In a meta-analytical account, then I isolated all the studies that I could find in the literature contrasting the stimulus-driven versus intention-driven actions. I isolated 24 of them. And again, you can see that the main character seems to be the mesial role of the frontal cortex. We also have a spot, an important one, in the parietal cortex. And you will see that this spot is actually, you know, coming back. But my main focus has actually been on the uh, way supplementary motor area. However, as I said, this dichotomy seems to be a little bit simplistic. And it's not simplistic only in the sense that all the action seems to be placed on the continuum, but it's really difficult to actually split this continuum in pieces. But also, uh, back in 2008, Agard um, and Brass suggested that uh, voluntary actions should be treated as a sort of, a sort of special form of decision making. Why is it special? It's special because usually in decision making patterns, you are reacting to some sort of stimulation. So you just need to use the information that is already there to make your action. And uh, intention action seems to be special because you need somehow to come up with some sort of stimulation in order to make your own decision. And what I suggest is that uh, um, we need uh, at least uh, three different uh, forms or kinds of information generation. One is about what, so which action to make. One is about when to perform the action. And the last one, it is a bit controversial, but it's about whether to make the action or not. So this is very much linked to the Pito discussion, but the idea is that the very last thing that you need to do before making action is to decide whether you actually want to make it or not. And uh, Patrick and Brass <laughs> suggested that these three components uh, could be located in three different regions of the brain. And uh, for some reason, I got very curious about this idea, and I started with uh, a new analysis in which I classified all the studies in the intention driven neuroimaging literature according to the specific pattern they used. And I managed to basically identify three different clusters that are all in the mesial wall of the frontal cortex, but it seems like there is a sort of gradient whereby you have the one decision in the pre supplementary motor area slash supplementary motor area, you have one decision in the middle frontal gyrus, and here in front you have the decision about whether to make the action or not, so anterior stimulus. But uh, uh, One of the problems with meta analysis is that you never know whether your results are genuine or driven by differences, discrepancies in the pattern that have been used. So what I did actually back in my master was to design an FPI study in which I was trying to investigate the different components of volition within the same experimental design. So we have three different blocks, and you can see that the structure is kind of the same in the sense that I was comparing a stimulus-driven action in which I was telling participants, you need to do this specific thing, versus an intention driven action in which participants were free to decide about themselves. So the what component was a decision about move the index or move the finger, the one was about do it now, do it later, and the word was about plan it and do it, plan it and put the veto. Again, I know this is a bit controversial, but I was young. And uh, these are the results from the interaction effect. So basically, I was looking for brain areas in which uh, I had an uh, activation of that specific area of the code that was greater for one component rather than the others. And you can see again, this very nice gradient. So you can see that the web decision is more positive, but the what decision is halfway, and the weather decision 
is much more anterior. So this was my first exercise to say that uh, although intention driven action has been treated as a sort of a unitary concept in the literature, clearly they are not. Clearly, it seems like uh, we have been using different patterns and probably capturing different shades of this voluntary action concept, but the story seems to be much more complicated. I do agree that uh, in, in this particular scenario, so intention driven action would be seen as a sort of decision making exercise. And I can see that uh, the media frontal cortex seems to be the main character. However, it's not so simple because it seems like different portions of the media of the cortex actually uh, do different things. So, I need to be mindful of the time. Okay. Second component. The second component uh, lies into this dichotomy between actions that are pre planned, deliberate, so you put some thinking into them, versus actions that are just around the movement, so minimal cognitive involvement. And this dichotomy has been approached uh, into the readiness potential literature. What is the readiness potential? Is this graph increase in the negativity that you can capture with EEG, starting about two seconds before the time of the action, usually on the premotor cortex, or continues to rise until the time of the movement. At this time, there is a steep change in the polarity. And of course, this has been associated with the liver paradigm, and I'm not going to get into that because I don't use the liver paradigm. But uh, there is a very popular model at the moment of this readiness potential thing that says that uh, readiness potential is actually not a readout of intentionality, but just accumulation of noise. Basically, you have some random fluctuations in the brain, they reach a threshold, when they reach a threshold, the action happens. So, According with sugar, readiness potential is just noise. So this sits in a particular spot in the free will debate, and I'm not going to get into that. But for me, it was a bit questionable the idea that, OK, so what does it mean from a cognitive point of view? If it is readiness potential, it's just kind of noise. Maybe I should see greater readiness potential for actions that are randomly executed, since this is just a readout of some sort of random accumulation. Well, we should see a smaller readiness potential when the action are deliberated and pre-planned. But this was a bit odd already because uh, back in the days, back in Libas, 1986, there was already some sort of tiny little evidence that uh, this may be exactly uh, the other way around. So we may actually see greater readiness potential when participants put more deliberation into their um, action. And uh, I thought that uh, what is the situation in which uh, you basically perform the very same movement, but at the beginning you do it in a sort of trial in a way, so a more random movement. At the end, you do it with more deliberation. I decided to use a temporal reinforcement learning paradigm because in our everyday life, that's kind of what happens. So at the beginning, when you're learning a new skill, you just try it out, and at the end, you do it. Uh, thinking about this, so pre-planning it. And uh, I decided to adopt this temporal reinforcement learning task in which participants had to learn the correct time to act. So the idea is that um, the previous story, participants were farmers planting a seed at the beginning of the trial, and they had to learn the correct waiting time to press a button to harvest a strawberry from the ground different fruits for different blocks and different target time. No. Here you can see an example, for example, for a strawberry, the correct time to press the button to harvest it for the ground was about seven seconds. So participants at the beginning of the block nearly uh, press the button too early and receive the too early uh, outcome or feedback. And they progressively learn to adjust their motor plan in order to get a more constant and positive outcome. So here you can see that there are different target types and participants' performance basically converge towards a stable learning effect. And I computed what I, I assume a discussion about how to call this measure and I decided to call it a trial to trial change in the waiting time. Basically, I computed the difference 
in the reaction time one trial and the subsequent one. That is somehow reflecting the prediction error. So the idea is that at the beginning, you have a very large update between one trial and the other. But progressively, when you gain a stable performance, this trial by trial update becomes very, very small and kind of constant. And this is the result on the gradient potential. So basically, this is a median split representation, but the nice it was just a regression between this measure, the, the measure of the update, the measure of learning, and the um, readiness potential slope. And the idea is that the readiness potential is much stronger, the slope is much more steeper late in learning. So when participants knew what they had to do, readiness potential was greater. And this is exactly in the opposite direction of the stochastic model, because the stochastic model will say that early in learning, when you're just acting randomly, you should see greater readiness potential. Okay, so it looks like readiness potential is actually greater for deliberate pre-planned actions. And if we accept that the readiness potential is a sort of readout for voluntary motor processes, that it seems like these mechanisms are actually strengthened when you know what you are about to do. But uh, the component that I'm actually having most of the time at the moment is uh, the goal directedness one, because the idea is that um, uh, most of the literature about voluntary action has, uh, has been criticized because we don't really capture what we mean for voluntary action in the everyday life. And that's because uh, in our experiment, for example, if you think about the traffic-like experiment, uh, participants don't really have a reason to press a button with the mean, middle or index uh, uh, finger. While in our everyday life, we act for a reason, we have a purpose, we have a goal that we are trying to achieve. So I do think that this component must be included in the picture when we are thinking about the components of voluntary actions. And uh, there have been some attempts to somehow put this goal directiveness into the picture. For example, this is an attempt from California in which they basically played with the value of the action. But I've never been fully on board with this approach because uh, what I'm rather doing at the moment is to move into a problem solving type of approach. Why problem solving? So, this is a, a, an example of the classic. Tower of London task that has been introduced by Tim Charles in 1982 for testing executive functions in patients with frontal lesions. And what you need to do in this task is just to rearrange these colorful boards between types of, to match the start and the goal configuration. But you need to do it with the minimum number of moves as possible. And for me, this was a, a very nice window on the uh, voluntary action goal directed sort of. Uh, investigation because first of all these actions are internally generated in the sense that uh, looking at the goal doesn't solve the problem so the stimulation is not enough for you in order to know what you need to do so you need somehow to come up to internally generate some information to actually get to the goal but at the same time these actions are intrinsically goal directed so this is part of the task you need to achieve the goal and I also I also got uh, uh, very excited by the idea of studying volition in a sequence um, setting. Because usually we have been studying voluntary action in sort of artificial isolation from each other, like there are single units. But this is not really what happens in our everyday life. It's not that we go around and we just press buttons. Usually we have a goal and we plan a chain of action in order to get and uh, achieve it. So I, I wanted to study something that resembles a little bit more a voluntary action in the everyday life but still, of course, in an experimental setting. So this was uh, my experimental design, that is a modified version of the Tower of London in which each, each action entails two different movements. The first one is to select the board that you want to change position to, and the second movement is to release it. So basically, you select it and you release it. And this for me is a movement. And my first comparison was between Tower of London problems in which it's up to you to plan and solve the problem through a sequence of internally generated movements versus uh, a version of the problem that is exactly the same, but you don't have the goal. 
You just need to execute one by one the instructions that are depicted there. Same motor output. Here it's up to you. Here is stimulus driven. And of course, the first comparison is probably a bit simplistic, but you can see that our main cortex are still here. So you can see the activity of the visual world of the frontal cortex. We can see our parietal cortex. And of course, we do have some more activations that are linked to the fact that we are studying voluntary action in an enriched context. So we are escaping from the minimalistic decide whether you want to press the button with the index of middle finger. But of course, um, fMRI doesn't provide you the temporal solution to conclude anything about the, the temporal dynamics leading up to the time of the action execution. So I decided to move to EEG and I repeated the very same comparison. And I use a multivariate pattern analysis approach with the support vector machine. So I trained my classifier on 90% of the data, tested on 10%. And what I wanted to do is to see whether it was possible to predict whether the action that was about to be generated was a self-generated one or a stimulus-driven one. And I wanted to see whether it was possible to predict looking at the brain activity preceding the time of the action in one second. So uh, the statistical test here is uh, uh, performed with uh, a sort of permutation approach. And in pink, you can see the areas in which uh, the time, basically the time frames in which it was possible to decode between self-generated and extracted movements, looking at the brain activity, we're seeing in the option one second. So the classification of accuracy is higher than chance level for the entire time. But it feels like at a certain point, the information about whether the action was self-generated or extraction, extraction starts to uh, be lost in the brain. So at a certain point, it feels like it becomes harder and harder to decode whether the action was self-generated or extracted. And this is a future weight analysis just to see which electrodes contributed the most to the classification accuracy. And you can see that the topography is roughly about the pre motor motor cortex that is very much in line with the readiness potential topography. But at this point, uh, I got into the idea that, okay, great, so let's use this task to explore the dichotomy between planning and execution. Why? Because usually you can't really tease them apart. So when you have a single option, you can't tease apart planning and execution. But the sequence was offering me the possibility to separate the processes of execution and planning. And the way I did it was to look at the brain activity before the first movement and before all the other movements. And why was I doing it? Because in tower of experiments, you need to solve the problem within the minimum number of moves as possible. And if you look at the reaction times, when the sequence is short enough and doesn't exceed participants' working memory, you have a great reaction time before the first move of the program, and then reaction times are very short and pretty constant. So we can assume that all the planning is happening here, and the execution is then happening during the rest of the sequence. And here I adopted a, a connectivity approach. So I use my pre-supplemental motorial cluster as the seed, and I look for connectivity patterns between pre-supplemental motorial and all the other areas in your brain. And I was particularly interested in possible differences in these connectivity patterns between first move and others. And uh, the results suggested that the pre supplementary motor area is interconnected with other prefrontal regions like middle single road, anterior single road, and the uh, inferior frontal cortex before the first movement of the sequence. But it was very nice that we have a completely different connectivity pattern between pre supplementary motor area and in this case in the superior parietal lobule during the execution. And it seems like this is a switch from planning and monitoring. So at this point, uh, I was happy at this new paradigm. I can actually have fun with that. It seems like uh, I can say something about voluntary action using this much bigger picture. So let's have fun with that. And uh, I got uh, super interested about uh, the idea of counterfactual action, so action that you could have done otherwise. And I got interested in this because this is very much linked to the Buidan donkey um, 
pirate. So the idea that uh, you have two don you have a donkey looking at two different piles of food, but since they are identical, the donkey doesn't have any reason to pick one rather than the other and is starved by indecision. And the idea is that we are kind of in the same situation because all the theories of motor control try to say that the goal is the most important thing, the goal is hierarchically superior, and it doesn't really matter which actions you actually implement in order to achieve it. So this was already there in James, but it's still here in the car, in active inference formulations. And this is great, I agree with that, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we still need to make a choice. We still need to actually pick our means in order to achieve our goal. And I want to see how we do it and what does it happen to the action path that we didn't take. And the Tower of London task offered me this very nice and pretty moments in which you have such, you have a goal, and you have two ways of achieving the goals that are from an optimality point of view absolutely identical. So the idea is that you can go from here to here with five movements, and it doesn't really matter which one you take. But you still need to make your option, you still need to make your choice. So I started with just a pilot study to see what happens, and I wanted to see whether I had a difference in the reaction time before the first move of the sequence and before, sorry, before the first move in the sequence, performance with and without an alternative path. And quite disappointingly, I didn't find any. So if you have an alternative or not, the reaction time for the first move is absolutely the same. But then I had this sort of awake moment in which I said, okay, let's see what's happening at the first move that is committing you to a path rather than the other. So this is the move that differentiates between the two alternative paths. And I look at the reaction time and I got this massive difference between reaction time for the movement preceding the action, preceding the choice that is committing you to one path and all the other actions in the sequence. So the reaction time for this movement here that is leading you to decide which path you want to take is much longer than all the others, even if you include the first move of the sequence. So I wanted to see whether, is there anything special going on in the brain for this specific uh, um, action? So again, I train my classifier to decode between bifurcation points, so turning point moves, you can call it as you want, and all the other moves in the sequence. To see whether it was possible to predict whether that particular movement would have been a turning point or not. And again, the results seems to be significant up to a certain point. So up to 300 milliseconds before the time of the action, it is possible to decode with decent accuracy between an action that is gonna be a bifurcation point and all the others. Topography seems to be a little bit different, so it seems to be a prefrontal job rather than a premotor one. But then I felt like, okay, but what's happening to the path that we didn't take. So for example, you need to move from here to there. You decide that you want to go for this path. What's happening to this other one? You just forget it, you just remove it. Have you ever represented it? And uh, do participants have more conscious access to it? Maybe word conscious is a bit controversial, but do they know that there is an alternative? And they really didn't really know how to explore it. Huh? I just decided to try something out. I asked my participants to, again, perform this tower of random problems, but immediately after each program, I asked them one at a time. I've just seen this configuration in the sequence you just completed, and I presented them one at a time, seven different configurations. One was the goal, so the sanity check. Two were paths, sorry, configurations belonging to the chosen path. Two were configurations belonging to the alternative path. And so we're completely new states matched for visual similarity. And the idea is that participants don't have any reason to say, yes, I saw this configuration when it was an alternative potential possible action. But maybe they will do it because maybe simply representing it, simply activating the representation of the alternative path, or maybe simply 
considering it as a possible alternative is enough to induce you to believe that you actually did it. And this is actually what I observed. So this is the proportion of uh, all the answers. So when participants said, yes, I, I did it, I saw it. You can see that this is the crucial comparison. So they don't have any reason to say, yes, I saw this configuration because they didn't. But there is a bias in their memory whereby they tend to say more often, yes, I saw it, I did it, when they didn't just because this was an alternative possible configuration. Now, of course, there is a sort of confound here because uh, it's very unlikely that they reconstruct the plausibility a posteriori. It's unlikely because when I'm showing the different alternative parts, I'm showing them one configuration at a time. Maybe they remember the goal, but it's highly unlikely they remember the start and they compute it backwards, but who knows? So what I'm trying to do now in my, not in my lab, but I don't have results yet, is to see whether I can decode in advance whether the configuration will lead to a false memory at the time of the action execution. If this is the case, it means that this is not a reconstruction, a posteriori bias, but there is something special about planning it. The simple fact that you plan it is enough to induce you to think that you did it. So that's what I'm having fun at the moment, but I don't have the results yet. Maybe I'll show you the results at the time. <clears throat> but in the last part of my talk, I want to touch a little bit, but without getting too much into detail, the idea that uh, Voluntary actions are special because uh, compared to not voluntary actions, they have a sort of conscious subjective experience associated. And there are two main subjective experiences that we have when we perform voluntary movements. One is the experience of being about to do something. It is the experience of intentionality, urge to move, call it as you wish. And this has been always uh, and most investigated with the Libet clock. Again, I'm not a fan of your the clock, so I never use it, probably never will, because the other subjective experience that I'm actually interested in is the experience of agency. That is the later feeling that your action caused something. So you feel responsible for the outcomes that you generated through your own action. And uh, again, we are in the domain of voluntary action, so studying this phenomenon is always very, very difficult. And sense of agency uh, is not different in this sense because you could potentially ask participants, did you do it or not? But it sounds a bit trivial and also uh, is very much prone to biases of investigability, self serving bias, everything. So we do have this explicit pattern that are uh, actual recognition tasks, they are widely used, and uh, participants uh, here get asked explicitly, was this action yours or not? I'm not a huge fan of this. I'm actually a huge intentional mining supporter. And uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with intentional mining, but uh, intentional mining is the, percep the perceptual subjective compression of time between the time you make an action and the time of the consequence. So the idea is press the button, turn the light on. If you do it voluntarily, you will perceive the time lapsed between the action and the outcome shorter than its real lasting. And this effect has been interpreted as a, an indirect implicit measure of sense of agency because this effect is not there when the action is performed in a passive way. So the idea is that if you have an experiment of pressing your finger, or if you ask a participant to judge the time between two tones, two uh, different events, this subjective compression of time is not there, or it's even in the opposite direction. So it's important that when you use the intentional mind effect, you always have a control condition. Because if you don't, then people can say, this is just a bias in time perception, but it's not. Because this is a bias in time perception, it is specifically linked to the action. So it implies some sort of sense of agency. And that's why I do believe it's a good measure of sense of agency. Uh, the dual basis of the intentional mining effect are remarkably well known, so we know that there is something happening again in the middle world of the frontal cortex. Seems like the parietal cortex is also involved. What we don't know is where is the intentional mining coming from. So it's a bit controversial. And I'm not going to spend too much time here because I don't really want to get into the actual interest story. 
But what I'm trying to um, see at the moment is whether we can link integral binding with prediction error. And in particular, I wanted to explore whether the intentional binding could be linked to prediction error in a learning setting. So I went back to my um, Farmville experiment, but I modified it a little bit. So here you are still learning the uh, correct waiting time to act so that you can have a positive feedback, but I squeeze into the intentional binding pair. So the idea is that you're waiting, you make your action, there is a random delay, there is a tone. I ask participants, which was a delay between the tone and the outcome, so I can infer my intentional binding effect, and then I actually give participants the outcome. In the content condition, this was COVID, okay? So I remove the action and I put another tone. So my control is, can you please estimate the time delay between these two different tones? Otherwise, uh, a better control would have been a passive movement, but this will do. And uh, again, I computed these trial to trial changes in the waiting time. So the idea is that at the beginning, they are um, bigger dates between one trial and the other because you are learning. At a certain point, this becomes much more stable. But another thing that I wanted to play with was the precision of the outcome. So I built these two different Gaussian somehow that were stretched that are, um, they represent the bandwidth of the probability distribution of the feedback. So the idea is that in one condition that was in specific blocks, so this was manipulated in blocks, not in the event-related way, it's very, very easy to get a positive feedback, but the feedback is not very informative. In the other condition, it's much harder to get a positive outcome, but the outcome is far more informative. For example, if the target time in this particular example is 2.25 seconds, and the actual reaction time is 3.25, in the higher feedback probability condition, you have a 0% chance of getting a positive outcome. In the other condition, you still have a 50% chance of getting a positive outcome. So getting the positive outcome is much easier, but it's less informative. And I made this for the different public farms, different fruits. For each fruit, I had two blocks. One was with the high and the other was the low precision of the feedback. So first, uh, I had a look at the performance and it feels like uh, the performance itself, it doesn't really it doesn't change significantly with the outcome precision, but the update changes a lot because the idea is that when you have a higher precision, you keep on updating. So when you have a low feedback precision, basically you get a lot of great, good job. So participants stop updating their, uh, their prediction, while in the other condition, they keep on adjusting the performance. And um, this is just a sort of control that we do have the intentional manic effect. Again, uh, the intentional manic effect is the underestimation of the delay. So how do you read this table? Here is the perceived action, action outcome, uh, action outcome, outcome, and this is the actual interval. You can see that participants, especially at 600 and 900 milliseconds, underestimated the time delay, but while the control condition, that is the dotted line, doesn't really reflect this underestimation, in the active condition, the slope is much flatter. So the idea is that they are keeping on underestimate the time delay, but it feels like there is no main effect of the outcome precision here. So the main result is actually this one. And this is, again, pretty difficult to read, but the idea is that Intentional binding is underestimation. So here I computed the perceived interval minus the actual interval. So negative numbers, intentional binding, positive numbers, no intentional binding. So intentional binding happens here, no intentional binding happens here. The first thing that you can see is that uh, there is a main effect of learning. So the intentional binding seems to be the greatest when participants are trying it out. So when they have the higher, highest prediction, 
So at the beginning of the block, so this is computed not in time, but based on the delta WT measure. The idea is that when they don't know what to do, the intentional binding is the strongest. The idea is that you're learning to ride your bike. At the very beginning, you don't know what, you, what you're doing. You have a stronger sense of agency. You need to boost your control because you're learning something and your prediction error is very high. When you're learning, your prediction error is reducing and the sense of agency is also reducing. So the idea is that with learning, when you are more proficient, you actually know what you're doing, your sense of agency progressively decreases. And it's interesting that it decreases, particularly in the condition of low reliability. So the idea is that here, you're getting a lot of good job. You're doing great. So somehow you're probably letting go some control. So this is my interpretation of the phenomenon, at least. Yeah, you need your strong sense of agency because you're learning, you need to pay attention to what you're doing. But progressively, you're letting go of some control, especially when you're getting so many positive feedback. But the idea, the, probably the take home message at the moment is that it seems that the intentional money effect is somehow related to stronger prediction. Okay, so this is uh, just a recap of what I just said. And this is the actually the end. So I present some evidence from all the different features. I do have a practice, a favorite one, of course. But in my mind, all of these are somehow necessary to make an action more voluntary than the other. And that's it. So thank you to Pajik, of course, other collaborators at UCL and University of Milan. And now, if you want to remain in touch, you need to divert your attention from UCL to Burbank University, so other side of the square. This is the name of my lab. I know it's not great, but I'm still kind of thinking about it. And this is my email address. So that's it.